So I flew in from Calgary today, and uh, Calgary has uh, many young children in the little, little gathering there in the hotel room, and it's uh, very encouraging to see. And I also ask your prayers for the beginning of the second year of the seminary of Our Lady of Mount Carmel down in Boston, Kentucky. The first year was rocky and rough, as to be expected in, in starting a foundation. If God wills to bless it, usually God's blessings are shown in many crosses. So frozen pipes and uh, freezing rooms and no hot water are many good signs. So hopefully this year, um, with your prayers, uh, that we enter into the second year. Father Piver in France, he will also begin a seminary also this fall, if not this fall, certainly next, next year, to train priests. And uh, Father Piver, as you know, he's, he's the big canon lawyer in France, um, and he has seen this coming down the pike a long time, this compromise towards modernist Rome. Bishop Follet is supposed to meet in a couple weeks with Cardinal uh, de Noia, and also with uh, Monsignor Pozzo of the Ecclesi Dei Commission. So everyone hails this as imitating Archbishop Lefebvre and as a very good thing. But Archbishop Lefebvre, he didn't play games with the enemies of Jesus Christ. When he figured it out after quite a few years that these men are not honest in his own words, they're not honest men, and they want to uncrown Jesus Christ, the King. As he told Cardinal Ratzinger of the, at the time, you seek to uncrown him, we want to crown Jesus Christ as King. And that's why there, we cannot work together. You're on AM, we're on FM. We stand on the shoulders of the popes of tradition. You stand on the flimsy shoulders of Paul VI and John XXIII, which is a total invention from hell, the Second Vatican Council. And they didn't use their infallible authority, so the Holy Ghost was told, get lost. And any chance there was of tradition triumphing was quickly, quickly muzzled and snuffed out by the triumph of the enemies of Christ who hijacked the council, overthrew everything that Archbishop Lefebvre and the Cetus Patrum prepared, and uh, the smoke of Satan certainly entered. As we all know, you don't, you don't need much proof. You don't have to be just half, half, half an eye to see the damage of Vatican II. So what really Bishop Follet should be telling Rome is your holiness and your lordship, cardinals and bishops, gladly we would talk if you profess what Pius X said in Pascendi, Pius IX in Quanticura, Gregory the Sixteenth in Merari Vos, Pius IX in the Syllabus, Leo the Thirteenth in all his doctrine on the, the Church and State, Pius X's anti-modernist oath, Pius XI quas primas on the kingship of Christ, and so forth and so forth and so forth. That's what the Archbishop said. And he said, if Rome ever wants to talk, I will put it on the doctrinal level, because that's where the fight is. And the enemy knows if you can give in on doctrine, they've got you. They've got you. If you deliver the engine, you've got the whole vehicle. And that's what has happened with the doctrinal declaration of April 15, 2012. The Superior General and the leaders of the society officially sold out the engine. And everybody's worried about the fender's going to get harmed because of the agreement. Well, the harm of the agreement was precisely selling the engine, that is, accepting the new mass as legitimate, accepting the new code, accepting Vatican II as deepening and enlightening Catholic tradition, accepting, unbelievably, religious liberty as reconcilable with the Church's magisterium. <clears throat> How can a heresy condemned many times by the Church be in any way reconcilable with what the Church has taught? It's not possible. So, uh, here it is. Here's another proof of the 
of the conciliar direction that has gripped the leaders of the Society of St. Pius X, and quite simply put, Operation Suicide has replaced Operation Survival. Archbishop Lefebvre set up Operation Survival, and he gave the directions, and he told the four bishops, when we have a perfectly Catholic pope, then make your agreements. And you won't have to make an agreement because all you'll have to do is submit your Episcopal powers to him and he'll use it for the glory of God and the reign of Christ the King. And there won't even have to be discussions because if the Pope professes the faith, we profess the faith, that's final. That's all we hope for. But until then, until then, don't put your, this in the Archbishop's own words, this is the greatest danger threatening our faithful which is to put ourselves in the hands of these modernists. And how do you put your hands, yourselves in the hands of the modernists? By accepting the modernist errors. Vatican II in the light of tradition, the new mass, and so forth. So the battle rages on, dear faithful, and uh, don't get tired, don't get weary. And uh, the Arian heresy lasted over 100 years. We're only 50 years into this battle. So... You kids, you're growing up in the war, so that's good. So we must hold on. And we have Our Lady's warnings. The faith will be nearly extinguished from the face of the earth. We have Our Lord's own words. Charity will have grown cold. The Mass will be nearly wiped off the face of the earth, the sacraments of tradition. And the priests that have the faith, very, very, very few who have not compromised. And when Enoch and Elias come, they're going to be telling the traditional Catholics, the few that are left on the earth, they're going to be saying, hold what the church has always taught, remember Archbishop Lefebvre, and hold on to all that he taught and spread that. And nothing changes, nothing is new in the, in the glorious truths of the Catholic faith. It's always triumphant, always beautiful, always victorious. This is the victory over the world, our faith, says St. John. Our faith, not because we think so, but because Christ sealed it with his blood and commanded the apostles, go preach this faith to all nations. Who believes and is baptized will be saved. And then the crunch. This is the cruncher that everyone forgets in the, the Vatican today. Who does not believe will be condemned. Who does not believe the Catholic faith will be condemned. And that's Christ's own words. And he's not playing games. And that's why the, the battle for the faith right now is so serious. It's so serious. That's why the resistance is not just some, some nice invention to add some spice to uh, the boring modern life. Far from it. This is a war to stay faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ and to the popes of tradition and our founder, Archbishop Lefebvre, who saw clearly through this mess. So do pray for the beginning of the seminary year and uh, pray also for Father Thomas Aquinas in Brazil. He will hopefully receive some more monks to enter his monastery. Also in Abrier, the monastery there, which is with the resistance, the, the great lighthouse now in France, the Dominicans, uh, they have a handful of American monks and priests there, and I know a few of them. And uh, they have a big boys' school as well, and it's a, it's a great thing. So pray for their labors as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. There are ten lepers that come to our Lord. Nine of them are Jews. One of them is a Samaritan. The Samaritan is probably just tagging, tagging along in the back because the Jews, as a rule, didn't talk to the Samaritans. The Jews, as a rule, wouldn't even talk to a non-Jew. They were very rude, very uh, cold, uh, because they were the top dogs, and everyone else was, everyone else was the goyim, the cattle. And that was the thinking of the Pharisees. That's why they were so angry with our Lord because he was curing non-Jews. He was talking to old, old ladies and curing them who were not Jews. So 
the, the Jewish national pride was very thick. And so the nine Jews and the one outcast, the Samaritan, they, they beg our Lord to cure them. Notice the words, preceptor, preceptor, they say. Miserere nobis. Jesu preceptor, miserere nobis. Miserere nostri. Jesus, teacher, have mercy on us. What does that tell you? That tells you they don't have the supernatural faith. They're turning to him as a great rabbi. And they've heard he's cured many people. He's emptied out the hospitals in so many towns. And so they come to him as a great rabbi. But our Lord, of course, he doesn't refuse anyone who cries to him, who turns to him. God never turns a deaf ear to any sinner who is repented and contrite. And our Lord seeks to raise them up. And he does so. He tells them, obey the law of Moses. Go show yourselves to the priests. And on their way, they're miraculously cured. But the nine Jews, they fulfill the law, but they don't, they don't open their hearts and their minds to the faith. We might dare to speculate that being Jews, they thought, well, we're Jews and he should cure Jews anyway because we're God's chosen people. We deserve it. But the stranger, the Samaritan, 